think it's interesting. I'm going to talk about um, how overlay networks are important at AT&T, and they're all built on BGP, and we just heard a talk about how we have to replace BGP. And that's fine when it comes along. I'll be really eager to look more at OpenR and, uh, and uh, see what it could do for us in the future. So just as a short outline, um, of course, AT&T has a lot of public and private network services. They're built using overlays. Uh, I'm going to talk about the kind of the different scale parameters that we deal with at AT&T in our wide area networks, both for private and public networks. I'm going to talk about then uh, how we scale our underlay and overlays. Um, specifically, I'm going to talk a little bit about EVPNs, universal overlay. We're going to talk about the role of tunnels and then about the underlay and islands in our network and how we glue them. So at and network business isn't just the internet. We have a lot of uh, private services, both for mobile and wireline. Uh, we provide, in addition to normal wavelength or private line services on the packet side, we, have, we provide for our private enterprises. We provide layer two networks and layer three networks. Um, these all, we also have a lot of infrastructure networks that we build for our radio access network on the mobility network and for the enhanced packet core. We also, for our voice networks and IMS, um, we have a lot of infrastructure networks that we also build in, the same, in a similar way. So overlays are what we build these networks on. And we used to have independent networks. We used to have frame relay networks. And independent of our IP networks, and then we started to use to combine them into one common infrastructure. I view overlays from the cloud industry as really equivalent to VPNs that we offer, network carrier-based network VPNs that we offer, um, that we've been offering for some years for our enterprises. We offer both layer two bridging or point-to-point -point services, so or bridging if they're doing MAC address learning over multi-point. We offer layer three VPNs, complete isolation, so they can run any address space for v4 and v6. And now with our new cloud services, we have, we've been putting together overlays that have integrated routing and bridging in them, where you have to do multi-point bridging within a subnet, and then you have to provide a default router to get out to beyond the subnet. The idea of overlays is that you're going to hide these services and your endpoints, of course, and you're going to tunnel between those endpoints so the interior of your network doesn't need to know about the state within these individual networks that you're providing. And today our overlays are all built using BGP. Let me just talk about some of these different overlay services that we have today. We have Ethernet services. Um, we offer these globally, our private network services, mostly in the U.S., but we service a lot of uh, multinational companies with 170 POPs outside of the U.S. For Ethernet, we provide point-to-point -point services or pseudo-wire services. We often call them Ethernet virtual circuits. We also do multi-point services, uh, virtual private LANs. We have about 2,500 POPs. Most of those are in franchise where we are the, uh, the carrier of access. We have about 3,000 provider edge routers. There's about 400,000 services implemented in our Ethernet services. And they, they use about 1 million BGP routes to implement these. On our Layer 3 VPN services, which offer both IPv4 and IPv6 services, those have been implemented using um, RFC 2547, where you have a uh, a virtual routing forwarding plane that has the private um, routes in it and uses BG, multi-protocol BGP for the distribution. We have about 4,700 provider edge routers throughout the world and implementing around 18,000 VPNs. These are both for enterprise customers and for our own internal purposes. And currently, we're up to almost 5 million VPN routes in, this, in the control plane that creates these overlays. We also have remote and over-the-top IPv6 services. We have about 300,000 um, gateway routers on the premises and over 1 million clients for those services. We also build VPN overlays for our mobility backhaul. We have about 120,000 no-Bs and e-no-Bs. They all use tunneling, either IUB 
for uh, the 3G or GTP tunnels for the, um, for the LTE network. And these all tunnel back using overlays that we create back into the um, enhanced packet core. We also provide on the mobility network a lot of custom networks for enterprises where they have their devices, shipping companies or whatever, they have their devices that are not on the public internet, they're on our mobility network. We have a, around 4,000 or so of those of these private networks. We also have a large Wi-Fi business that we do for enterprises where we provide a, uh, hot spots for the public and private networking for these enterprises, say like McDonald's at all the restaurants. And they come back into the corporate network. Sometimes the wireless controller is implemented in the cloud. We tunnel back to that and we'll provide also hotspot service off of those. And that's around 300,000 of those. We also build our public internet service as an overlay. It uses MPLS. We don't have any, the, the internet route table is not present in any of our interior routers. We call it internet route free core. It only exists at the edge of the network, and the BGP next hop is an MPLS shortcut from one PE to another PE inside our network. We have around 6,000 PE routers globally for internet services. There's about 750,000 unique routes, prefixes in our route tables. That includes the routes we exchange with customers and peers and our own internal prefixes that are not aggregated. And, the, and there's about 6 million paths for those routes in our routing table. That's because we have multiple, uh, we, we see those paths over multiple interconnects with different user on different customers and peers. On our broadband um, services, we have about 15, 16 million broadband connections across about 150,000 different kinds of access nodes, mostly DSLAMs, but some of those are um, OLTs for PON networks. And these are spread across 4,700 um, offices and wire centers where we provide the access for those customers. Those are all architected using VLANs. We've moved, most of our access architectures all move to a VLAN access architecture where we define customers, the interface as a VLAN and services as a VLAN. And so a lot of our overlays, the interfaces of our overlays and the access and in the cloud into our compute is usually defined in terms of VLAN interfaces. And so a lot of what we do in, um, in our overlays is how to groom and um, the, those VLAN services. So let me talk a little bit about how we are now using eVPN as a universal overlay. So we had a separate uh, 2547 layer 3 VPN overlays. We've had the uh, Curity, Compella, VPLS, BGP implemented uh, overlays. Now we look at, we're looking at using, we've started using eVPN as our universal overlay. Let me talk a little bit then about the capabilities that eVPN provides. It provides layer two multi-point bridging, so address learning. It provides um, even point-to-point -point services where you're not doing address learning. So VPWS is now a capability that you can do eVPN. And in that case, when you're doing just point-to-point -point services, you can have what's called a flexible cross-connect. I have a figure coming up on the next slide to show this, where what you're doing is defining essentially a logical port on your switch that acts like any other port that can have its own namespace, its own local tagging, double tagging. And so you can do flexible cross-connect grooming of VLANs into that, uh, that logical port, which maps to a single pseudo-wire. And that way we're able to groom up many thousands of subscribers onto a logical pseudo-wire without having to have all those subscribers appear directly in our control plane. eVPN, although the original intent was to provide layer two um, virtual ethernet networks, it carries prefix information, IP prefix information. Um, I think originally maybe for things like ARP um, information, but nevertheless, it's now being used to carry, uh, to create layer three VPNs, just like the 2547 uh, defined VPNs do. And also because it has both the ethernet information, the MAC addresses and bindings and, and prefixes, it can also now do integrated routing and bridging. And so we take advantage of that in our cloud when we have traffic that needs to go 
within the subnet and also without, outside the subnet without having to hop through yet another virtual router. EVPN also provides a notion of being multi-home where you can have multiple accesses appear as a single lag to the client without having to run a proprietary vendor implementation of their uh, multi-chassis lag. So let me talk a little bit about these use cases that we have um, are now starting to use at at and in what we call our Domain 2 cloud initiative. Um, for example, uh, uni to uni services would be traditional Ethernet pseudo-wires, Ethernet virtual circuits, where you have a, a customers just going site to site with a, 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 um, a virtual circuit here, where you might be doing some QoS capabilities like shaping or policing to that service. So it's a very simple uh, um, service that this takes you from one port to another. But we also like the ability of EP, EVPN for the flexibility of access and how it can bring in large numbers of subscribers or provide the individual connections if we need it. So in the flexible cross-connect of EVPN, we can take VLANs off many different physical ports on a switch that were connected. For example, if we were connected to ponds, where we have thousands of customers on an optical line termination, I may want to bring those thousands of customers to some maybe broadband network gateway function in one of our offices. I need a flexible way to do that. And the flexible cross-connect of eVPN allows that. What it does is it means I can have a local VLAN tagging, double tagging address space on each port and on the pseudo-wire itself. And so you're rewriting those tags when the VLANs come in. I can have some VLANs that are for businesses that are going off one way. I can combine VLANs for broadband residential subscribers all into one pseudo-wire by having the, um, the VLANs rewritten. And then they can drop off at the... Um, at the virtual network function on the right-hand side of the, um, of the network here in the cloud. This is cut off a little bit, the slide that says a virtual BNG on it. Oh, it's okay up there. It's not okay down here. In this case, I intentionally show a diagram where the tunnel terminates directly in the virtual network function itself. And now all I have to do in the virtual network function is advertise the reachability information. And in this case, it's either IP address or a route target. And the, it will, where the traffic needs to go for this tunnel, for this pseudo-wire, is auto-discovered. And so if I want to move this virtual network function to another computer, I want to drain it or I want to recover from a failure, and I move it over, all as it does, all it needs to do is announce its reachability information. I don't have to go back out to the far end, the left-hand PE here, and reprogram any information. The tunnel, the pseudo-wire, will automatically reroute to that location. I don't need, so we have, it will automatically follow the service that it's tied to without having to do a, a global controller to, re, to um, remap the connections. And so we really like this kind of feature. Also, as I mentioned, in the cloud model, we have a need now with applications or host applications that are in a subnet that need bridging represented by the orange here, where I need inter-subnet brid bridging where I can respond to ARPs directly between hosts, and I need the ability to go out to a default gateway to get out to the, either the internet or my private network. And so I want the ability without having to go through in some of these cloud models yet another router just for the gateway routing and another virtual instance, I can have that all integrated in one routing context, in, a, in an integrated routing and bridging context, where the default gateway will be advertised and answered to ARP requests in every one of those instances on each of these leaves. And I intentionally drew this so that on the left-hand side, we have an instance that looks like it has a team, a lag to do two different switches. It doesn't know that it's two different switches. And the EVPM will automatically answer on each side, and make it look like it's a single lag and that there's a, um, a default gateway there. And so I no longer need the multi-chassis lag capability. Now on the right-hand side, we have an instance where it terminates, instead of all the way in the VNF or in, the, uh, in your leaf switch, it terminates maybe in your virtual switch, in your virtual router inside the, the server. And it would then break out the individual VLANs and hand it off to the, uh, to the tenant. 
So I want to say a little bit about tunnels. Tunnels are what uh, overlays are implemented on. Our uh, overlays have been implemented using MPLS as the tunnel between the different PEs. When you advertise in BGP, the um, whatever address family, whether it's your VPLSs or your layer three VPNs or now eVPN, your BGP next hop is what you're tunneling to. That's what you're getting a shortcut LSP to. Now in our cloud model and, and where we've implemented um, overlays for our mobility network and our virtual EPC, we are using IP tunnels and not MPLS tunnels there in our implementation. And we need a way to glue the two together. For example, we can have a, an S gateway in the enhanced packet core that needs to get out to our RAN network. And we have an overlay network, a layer three network that supports, well, originally was IPv4, now it's IPv6 as we've moved most of our enhanced packet core to IPv6. It routes out to reach the radio access network. But we need to glue together the fact that our new enhanced packet core devices are using IP for the tunnels and reachability to our MPLS and our wide area network. And this is where we use an autonomous system border router between the data center and the WAN network to map the two together. In this case, in the bottom, there's an IP tunnel, and at the top, there's an MPLS tunnel, and the BGP next hop is set at the ASBR, so it does a next hop self for the route for the service that's inside the tunnel. And it, so the tunnels are glued together. You have a label two on the top that's stitched to the label one on the bottom, and you can use the tunnel attribute in BGP, the tunnel path attribute, to indicate the encapsulation type you want. So you can have UDP, in theory you can have GRE, you could have VXLAN, or you could have MPLS. Those are all defined as encapsulation types, and they're all based on the path attribute that's advertised with that service. When you see that path attribute, it will dictate what tunnel type to use to reach the BGP next hop. Once you reach the BGP next hop, the tunnel ends, and then you have two different ways of interconnecting. One way we can interconnect is through a VRF, where you terminate the service and you actually do a lookup. If it's layer two, you're going to do a, a MAC forwarding decision. Layer three, you're going to do an IP longest prefix match. Or you can do what's called the option B method of stitching, where the route is the same coming from the other side, and you're going, you're going to do a next hop self when you advertise it to the lower portion here, and you're going to stitch the two labels together the label two on the top to label one on the bottom. Those are the inner labels that you would find inside the tunnel. And so we are doing this today as a way of supporting both IP and our underlay for tunnels and MPLS for our tunnels. However, this has a problem. This, these, it's well known, the issues with this kind of um, inner working, um, inter AS designs for overlays like this, where you end up having all your state of your services in this ASBR. And so we will, we've tried to get away from that by having another level of indirection, not having all the service information inside that forwarding table, inside that one element, which is stitching together the WAN to the um, data center. And so we have, because we have this data explosion, because we can have up to, based on all those overlay services I talked about, 10 million network layer reachability um, routes. We don't want those all to show up in single elements, single at least forwarding elements. We want to keep that separate with our sep by having the control plane separated from the forwarding plane. So instead of using an option A or option B enter AS connect model, we have a we have a higher, another layer of indirection. And essentially, it's a some people refer to it as. Um, RFC 3107, which is just a way of having another label for another route, and we do indirection. So, that the serv so what we do is we distribute all the PE loopbacks in BGP, and then we resolve the service information recursively to those PE loopbacks, and then those PE loopbacks then resolve to the ASBR hop. So in this example, the services we're able to isolate to just our route reflector planes, and the PE loopback information we're able to then distribute just between these ASBRs, which are re represented by the P blue boxes in between the different autonomous systems here. 
And this allows us to scale much better. And in fact, in our route reflector plane for our overlays, because we still have millions of routes there, we are able to have route reflector planes for the internet. We have a route reflector plane for our layer two services and our layer three services, and one that's separate for these PE loopbacks. And those can be run on the server. We, can, we have virtual route reflectors now that we run that can scale to huge amounts of memory to be able to scale up the, our requirements for this overlay control plane without the dependencies and the limits that you would have with your fibs down on your um, forwarding elements. Oh, that's it. So that's what I came prepared to talk about today. Is there any questions? Thank you for the talk. So, question specific to egress replication. Do you see any issues with lack of such? So, overlay draft doesn't support IMAT routes at all in uh, MPLS and CAP cases. No vendor has implemented egress replication. Do you need it? I, I didn't quite understand the question. Something about ingress replication? Egress replication. Um, well, today we have, uh, we have multicast VPNs that use the Rosen implementation and it uses a, a multicast uh, directly in the underlay rather than ingress replication. And we've been looking at doing ingress replication off and on, but today we use a multicast in the underlay. Specifically for EVPN. Do you oh, for EVPN. Um, there we have a vendor specific implementation that distributes it from one router to the next. So it's a, it's a distributed re ing type of ingress replication. Uh, to the data center, the overlay draft doesn't support IMAT routes at all, so there's no way to do egress replication anyway. Are you concerned about lack of, so you need to do ingress per remote endpoint? Um, I, I didn't quite follow, you're, you're talking about which draft doesn't support the ingress uh, replication? When you use uh, IP to not, not in PLS and CAP. Um, We've been having discussions, like I said, today our implementation is kind of a vendor implementation that distributes the replication. It's effectively an ingress replication solution. That's what we have today. And we have had internal discussions of what we're going to do going forward, and we, haven't, we don't have a decision on that yet. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Thanks so much, Chris.